All right. Well, let's take our Bibles here this morning. Let's go to the book of Genesis, chapter number 42, if we could. Genesis, chapter number 42. Uh, somebody once wrote, The purposes of God often develop slowly because His grand designs are never hurried. The great New England preacher Philip Brooks was noted for his poise and quiet manner. At times, however, he suffered moments of frustration and irritability. One day a friend saw him feverishly pacing the floor like a caged lion. The friend asked him, what's the trouble, Mr. Brooks? Well, he replied, the trouble is that I'm in a hurry, but God isn't. I'm in a hurry, but God isn't. We could say that Mr. Brooks was struggling with God in that point in his life. And I believe every Christian has those moments with God. We're struggling to comprehend what God is doing or not doing, if you will. And our hearts are having a difficult time with it. We're having a hard time comprehending what's going on. What God's doing, what God's not doing. Such was the case for Jacob. The scenario he found himself in was extremely troubling to his heart. And maybe today we can relate to that. But if we just give God a chance, we would see the good that he was trying to do. Here in Genesis chapter number 42, we're going to pick it up in verse 29, and we're going to read into the next chapter a few verses as well. But it says, And they came unto Jacob their father unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell them unto them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us, and took us for spies of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me, then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So will I deliver you your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. And it came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in the sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again." And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which he go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. And the famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass, when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me, as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother? And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words, Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. I will be surety for him of my hand, shalt thou require it. But if I bring him not unto thee, and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned this second time. And their father Israel said unto, him, unto them, if it must be now, do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man a uh, present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again in your hand. Peradventure it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother, and Benjamin. And if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Today I'd like to look at this passage a little bit closer as we talk about struggling with God, 
struggling with God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the subject matter we're going to look at today. I pray for much wisdom and help, Lord God, as I uh, present the Word of God and, and the things that come out of it in regards to this subject matter. No doubt we all go through periods of time where we struggle to know and struggle to accept what you're trying to do in our lives. May we surrender like, De like uh, Joseph, or Jacob did here in this case and that you may bring the good that you plan to bring. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What does it mean to struggle? One of the definitions Webster gives of this word, struggle, is that it is to labor in pain or anguish, to be in agony, to labor in any kind of difficulty or distress. In other words, we're often having a hard time trying to obtain something that we want or that we're seeking to get. And we're, we're struggling, if you will, with it. And really, when it comes to struggling, it's generally a contest between wills. It, that's what it kind of amounts to. And when we're struggling with God, particularly, we are generally striving against His will versus ours. There's a contest of wills that is generally going on when it's between us and God. We want something our way. And God wants something different or it done a different way. But we are tussling with that. We're having a hard time accepting that within our hearts. And we find ourselves getting a fall attitude. Because we can't figure out why God just isn't doing it the way that is most logical to us. He isn't doing it our way. And then we, we just start developing this foul attitude and we, we start feeling real negative. And everything that goes along with that. The struggle just rages within our hearts. We're having a hard time. It may not even be a bad thing we're necessarily wanting. But God wants something different in this scenario. God wants to do that a different way. God's working in ways that we cannot see. And we are failing to just trust Him with it. You know, God, when God works in these types of ways, we have to remember some things about God. Number one, His way is perfect. His way is perfect perfect. Psalm 1830 says it so well. As for God, his way is perfect. In other words, the way God plots out things, the way God leads our lives, the way God works is always right. When we're struggling, we're having a hard time comprehending that. And it might be because circumstances are such in life that we just cannot see how this is the perfect way how this is the best way. We're just having a very hard time comprehending that. But yet God says in his word, as for God, his way is perfect. And God's goal for each of us is to get us to the point of being completely submissive to his will in every area of our life. It's really what, what God's working on in these types of scenarios. And these scenarios that come up in our lives that cause us to struggle with him are, are God's way of putting a finger on these areas of our life that we just simply haven't surrendered to him. See, God's goal is to get us completely submissive to the point where whatever God wants, we're okay with it, and we just go with it. And we're at peace. It may not necessarily go the way we wanted it to go or exactly the way we were hoping it would go, but in time we see, boy, that was a whole lot better than the way that I wanted to go. But, but, it, but it really comes down to a willingness to submit to the Lord. The Bible tells us to do that. James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Can I ask us today, each one of us, have we done that? Have we submitted ourselves to God? Because if we have submitted ourselves to God, God's peace 
will be imparted because submission is an act of humility. And when we have a humble spirit, when we are submitting to God, guess what God gives us in return? His grace. James 4, 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Those who are submissive to him, because it goes on in verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. You just saw that verse. God gives grace, and he gives peace. See, when we're struggling, <laughs> what we're doing many times is bucking against something God is doing or not doing in our lives. We're telling God, I don't agree with this. God, I, I don't like this. What we're doing, in essence, is striving with our maker. <laughs> That's what it really is. We are striving with God over what he's allowing or not allowing to happen within our lives. Well, the Bible says this about when we strive with God. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou, or thy work? He hath no hands. In other words, questioning what God's doing. I know we've all done it. I've done it. Where I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, God, what are you doing? <laughs> but that's not right when we do that. We're guilty of striving with our maker. And that's why a person struggling is often quite miserable on the inside, and of course it bubbles its way out in the attitudes that they portray and the, the things that they do and say. See, if we're in line with God's will... We won't be miserable. We'll be at peace. But if we're struggling, we're having a tussle, and, and uh, you know, because something's not working out the way we think it should be working out in the time that we should think it should be working out, the way, it, you know, all those different things, what we're finding ourselves doing is, is bucking against God, and that's why we have a lot of misery within here. You can put on a good face in front of everybody else, but if we're having a, if we're, if we are, really struggling with something, it really comes down to us and a submission problem with God. See, our text is found amidst the story of Joseph. Of course, I, I preached about him recently in another message uh, about a situation there, but if you remember the story, he was a man sold by his brothers into slavery. And through a series of events, he becomes the second ruler in in Egypt, and all the things that he went through were part of God's preparation process and making him a man who could handle that position with humility and be used of God during a very critical time in world history when a famine had hit the world. Now, the world wasn't that big as far as the people population goes, and Egypt really was the center, you know, the, the world power at that time, at least one of them. And, and God was going to do something with that famine. And it would take a, a man who was prepared to be able to use that situation to bring God glory. And that's exactly what would happen with Joseph. God would train him for 13 years, really, to be ready to take in this position. And of course, we know, if you know the story, there was... Of course, first going to be seven bumper years of crops in Egypt. They would garner more food than they never had, only to prepare for the seven years beyond that, in which there would be, it would be a great dearth in the earth, a sore famine. And the world would come to Egypt looking for that food. And guess who would be the one, of course, there distributing it? Joseph, a faithful man of God. And of course, amongst all that going on, too, there was the nation of Israel that was in its infant stages, and God uh, wanting to protect it, to allow it to grow and to be the nation that it would become. Well, in the midst of the early days of the famine, Joseph's father, Jacob, had sent his sons to Egypt to buy food, but they ran into trouble, didn't they? If you know what happened. It's expounded a bit in our text in verses 29 through 35. They, they come back to Canaan and they tell Jacob what, what befell them, that the, that the Lord of the land uh, was rough with us. He, he, he accused us of being spies and, and told us 
not to come back for more food unless they brought the younger brother Benjamin back with them. And, and for as collateral, if you will, uh, Simeon was to stay back as well. So, I mean, it was kind of a, they got the food that they needed, but, you know, it was kind of a rough go for them. Of course, they didn't know that it was Joseph behind all this. But what they did know or what they did perceive as what was going on troubled them extensively. Especially when they had opened up their grain sacks and discovered that their money had been placed back within it. They're like, oh no, this is not good. How are we going to explain this one? <laughs> it looks like we stole the money. It mentions at the end of verse 35, they were afraid. They were afraid. And Jacob himself, one of the patriarchs, he just couldn't comprehend what was going on. He just couldn't. He, he just, in the midst of this worldwide turmoil, he just, what is going on? Look at verse 36. And Jacob their father said unto me, Unto them, me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not the one who, who showed the most promise, if you will, out of the boys. And Simeon is not another son. And you will take Benjamin away. And he makes this statement All these things are against me. You ever felt like that? Everything's against me. <laughs> you know, you look at multiple areas of your life, and it's like, eh, it's just all these negative things and, and, and so forth, or at least that's the way we perceive them. That's where Jacob was. I mean, that you, you and I have to get ourselves into Jacob's shoes and what he's experiencing and what he's seeing. His son is, one of his sons were, was killed, and he's still in grief about that, or at least he thought Joseph was killed. Now Simeon is held captive. Uh, the only way that they can get any more food is they bring Benjamin back, but that, that, that scares the daylights out of uh, Jacob because he doesn't want anything to happen to him, and, and, he, and this famine's going on, and, and he's got this large family. What's he going to do? You know, all this this stuff is spinning in his head. Can you relate a little bit? Yeah. There, there's, a, there's a big issue going on here. And right now, he's struggling with God. Like, God, what, what are you doing? In, in Jacob's mind, it was, he, they were teetering on extinction. To him... It's only a matter of time before it's all over. But unknown to him, God was at, a work, at work in a very, very unique way that he does not see coming. But there was something that had to happen first in the life of Jacob before that could take place. And we'll get into that a little bit more here today as we study this passage. But I want to talk about first off what I call the attributes present. You know, when we're struggling with God, or how do I know it's, I'm actually struggling with God? Well, there's some attributes that come out in this passage that kind of will tell us or will tend to be present in our lives when there's, been, when there's really a struggle with God going on. And there's about five or six of them or so. Number one a negative attitude. A negative attitude. Again, verse 36, Jacob says, and all these things are against me. Now God had brought him up to this point. You know, God had led him along. God had, had protected him from Laban, had protected him from Esau, got things right with Esau and everything. In that regards, I mean, Jacob, despite his flaws and some of the, his things that he had done wrong, God had taken care of him up to this point. But now he's got in his mind, all these things are against me. Everyone's against me. It's all, the, the, the deck is stacked against me. That kind of attitude. You ever had that? <laughs> Just kind of a negative attitude about what's going on in life. Everything's against me. Uh, I, I've got all enemies and no friends type attitude. When we're struggling with God, our attitudes go sour, don't they? as we, whether directly or indirectly, accuse God of not being good and caring. That's really what it is. We're, we're really accusing God of not being good and caring. 
that God has lost interest in our lives, that God has lost interest in, in what's going on and, and so forth. And if he, if he really cared, that's, what, that's when these thoughts start pop, popping into our mind. If God really cared, he would have done something by now. Boy, we can get a real negative attitude real quick. And that's where Jacob was. His attitude was, was quite negative. He had forgotten the truth that we see in Jeremiah 29, 11. Of course, he wouldn't have known this, but, but his life, there was times in his life where God expressed this. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. You know, sometimes we get into our minds that God has got it out for us, that God's brought us this far off just to drop us off and leave us on the curb, and that's it. You know, it's kind of like the children of Israel, after, years later, when they leave Egypt, they start getting upset, like, oh, what'd you do, bring us out here into the wilderness to die, Moses, and all that kind of stuff? You know, we get that mentality sometimes. When things start getting difficult and tough, and, and we're, we're kind of like, with God, God, what'd you do, just bring me here to, to drop me off and, and uh, kill me, or, or to dispose of me? Boy, kind of a sorry spirit, isn't it? But we're probably all very guilty of having that at, at points in our life. See, when we're struggling, we're disagreeing with what he's saying there. He's saying, God, I don't know if you really care about me as much as you say. It's kind of the attitude that's coming out of J Jacob. Number two, of course, there's fearfulness. Uh, verse 35, those last three words, it says they were afraid. You know, when we're struggling with God, it's often because we're fearful of what the future might hold. And that grips our hearts and influences our decisions. And we're no longer exercising faith in God. We're responding to fear. And the Lord hath not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and a love and of a sound mind. <laughs> a mind that thinks clearly. But yet, when we're struggling with God, we are often dealing with fears. Look at, look at verse 38. You can just see it in Jacob's statement. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in which he go, then shall you bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Can you say that he's pretty fearful? He's scared to death of losing Benjamin, and, he, and it's just the whole thought just shudders his mind. He's like, I will go to the grave with great sorrow. Number three, another attribute that is present when we're struggling with God is stubbornness. Stubbornness. Uh, again, verse 38, my son shall not go down with you. Uh-uh, not going to happen. Just, he is digging in his heels. And, and sometimes when we're struggling with God, we begin to dig into a, with our heels as well. Like, we're not going that direction. Uh-uh, that's not the way we're doing things. I've got my other, I've got my plan. I've got the way I think it will work best. And I'm just going to dig my heels in. Are we stubborn like that? Are we stubborn to the point where we're digging in our heels about a situation? God gives you advice through His Word or through counsel, and but we're like, uh-uh, I'm not doing that because that's just not the way. You know what? That is just pure stubbornness, <laughs> which is linked to pride, by the way. Very prideful. Which goes on to number four. We, we see unreasonableness. In verses 2 through 7 of Genesis 48, or 43, excuse me, you know, Jacob says, all right, we're out of food. Go again to, and buy a little, little food down there in, uh, in Egypt. And, and I could just see the boys being like, Dad, we've told you already. We cannot go down there. Because the man who's in charge says, you, you cannot see my face unless you have your son with me. And, and, and they're protesting. He said, we're not going to go down there. There's no point. We're, we're going to, we'll die on the way back. And, uh, and they're trying to reason with him. And, of course, Jacob goes on and says, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother? In other words, it's like, what in the world here? How would they know that what he was going to expect? And that's what they all explained in verse 7. And they said, in other words, all the brothers spoke up and said, Dad, come on here. This is ridiculous. How would we know what he said? We were just having pleasant conversation, or trying to at least. Just totally unreasonable. 
He's refusing, he's denying things, and he's gotten unreasonable. You know, I've known people, no matter how well they are argued against, no matter how much truth is given, they will not budge. They're just completely unreasonable people. I've tried to witness to some people like that, and I have, I have literally, and I don't mean this in a negative way, I've cornered them, uh-uh, uh-uh, not, no, mm-mm, no, mm-mm, you know, type attitude. And being unreasonable is not going to be helpful. It's connected, of course, to stubbornness. Stubbornness. Number five, what happens as well is blame shifting. Remember verse number six here. In Israel, Jacob said, Wherefore dealt you so ill with me as to tell the man whether you had a brother? What were you thinking telling him they, you had another brother at home? You're crazy. And, and he's putting the blame on them for putting them in this circumstance. It wasn't their fault. But somebody who struggles with God will shift the blame onto others and accuse others of making their life miserable or causing the problem. And they blame shift. And they fail to see their own lack of submissiveness to the will of God. They fail to see their own lack of submissiveness. Well, I know, other, I know people like that. Well, how about you? <laughs> Let's not be thinking about other people today. Let's be thinking about us when we struggle. Because I'll guarantee you, every person here, including this man in the pulpit, has had these moments. Well, I've blamed others. Oh, if it wasn't for this, blah, blah, blah. Um, no, Pastor Wardner, wait a minute here. It's me. It's me, it's me, oh, Lord, it's in need of prayer. And we need to be looking at ourselves. Not be thinking about, oh, you know, that person at home or that person down the street or whatever. We need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, is this what is really present in my life when I'm struggling with God? And I'll guarantee you every one of these things probably are. Probably are. Number six, you'll waste time. Verse 10. Judah trying to reason with his father. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned this second time. Now that was not a short trip, you know. It wasn't just a, an hour down the road or whatever. You know, this would have taken probably a few weeks to, to go down to Egypt and come back at the very least. I don't know how much time literally progressed, but I mean, he made this statement if we hadn't sat here and argued about this, you know, we would have been back by now. So evidently there was some time that had passed between some of this transaction of what was going on. We end up wasting time. Our struggles with God will cause us to waste time in life fighting which we ultimately which will ultimately be a losing battle between us and God. We're fighting a battle we're never going to win. And people lose sometimes years of spiritual productivity and joy because they are demanding God in so many words to bend to the way they want things instead of them bending to the way God wants things. And sometimes the fight goes on for years. And all that time it's wasted. All that time. And everything else that goes along with it. Hey, if we find ourselves struggling with the situation and these attributes are present, we're probably pretty miserable at times. We're probably very miserable. It's not hard to see that Jacob was miserable, is it? I mean, he was pretty miserable in this circumstance. He doesn't seem like he's very happy. Because he was trying to have things his way. What is it that we're struggling with right now within our lives? What are we fighting God over? How goes the battle? You know what I mean? How goes that battle? I haven't quite got them convinced yet, right? 
How goes that battle? Probably not very well. How much progress have we made spiritually? Probably not a whole lot. If we find these attributes present within our lives, let it be known that the battle isn't with other people. The battle is with God. And may these attributes be more of a, oh, <laughs> moment. A way to help diagnose the true problem. Versus, you know, trying to find a band-aid or, band or, or an aspirin to take away the symptoms. You want, if we want to solve our problems in life, we've got to find out where the root is. And these, all these attributes are just symptoms of this one problem. That struggle with God, that war, that tug of war we have with him. And they were very present in Jacob, wasn't it, weren't they? Let's continue as we see, secondly, what I call the accumulating pressure. Now, for a while, Jacob persisted in his resistance, didn't he? Verse 38, he said, my son shall not go down with you. <laughs> no! <laughs> no! Ever have been like that? No! We don't say it verbally, but it comes out in our attitude. No! Well, verse 1 of chapter 43, and the famine was sore in the land. In other words, what? Things just kept going on the way they were. It came to pass, verse 2, when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. Here they had... Time moved on. But pressure was mounting. Why? Because they're hungry. And this famine isn't going away. The pressure was mounting against Jacob. The famine wasn't getting any better. The food was running out. Their lives, their very lives, were being threatened as a result of this. Verse 8, Judah says, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. We know that there's roughly 60 to 70 people alive at this point in Jacob's camp because it's 70 that ultimately go down into Egypt with him. So, I mean, there's a lot of people here that are getting hungry, and maybe down to just a meal or two a day. And that probably wasn't a buffet. <laughs> and the pressure was mounting. See, when we persist in our battle of will against God's will, we'll find ourselves landing in situations that continually grow worse and not better. What The pressure will continue to mount. Now, Jacob just tries to shovel this under the rug. You know, he's just trying to ignore it. When he tells him, go buy a little food. But Judah's like, Dad, we can't. You don't understand. We told you what happened. And, of course, they were there. They were put in prison for three days, if you remember that. See, Jacob was finding himself in an increasingly difficult situation as his will is under accumulating pressure. And when we're struggling with God, don't be surprised to find how the pressure will mount against our will. Because God has to work on breaking down our will so that we learn how important it is to submit to his being stubborn and resistant is an act of pride and an affront to God himself. It's like telling God that, God, we know better than you, and, the, and that's just far from true. 
And God knows how much pressure it takes to finally break us. God really does. He knows how much it takes. And for some, it's pretty intense. Think about Pharaoh. God put a lot of pressure on Pharaoh, didn't he? Those ten plagues, they were brutal. And finally, it came to the point where, where God, had a, God moved upon the nation of Egypt where all the firstborn sons were, were dead in one night. You talk about a man, though. You, you think about all that transpired with those different plagues, if you know the story. I mean, it was brutal. But a man's pride sometimes is pretty hard to the point where it takes a lot to break it. Finally, he broke, didn't he? He said, all right, you guys go <laughs> and bless me as you leave. Only to reharden his heart and, and even worse things happened. More people died in that case. Nebuchadnezzar took seven years of basically insanity for him to finally break and say, <laughs> he's God. <laughs> Very hardened hearts. You know, it's our choice to submit to God or to be broken by God. Really what it comes down to. And God's not trying to be a cosmic meaning by doing that, but God knows what is best and what is good and how that is attained in our lives. What it comes down to is our stubborn, willful pride that fights against God because we can't see what He sees though he has promised good things, and his character backs that up. His character backs that up. And he does not work in our lives until we have submitted ourselves to him because he's not, he's not going to give up his position as God to us by letting us dictate how things should go. God's not going to do that. We have to remember in this scenario that God had promised Jacob that his seed was going to blossom and become a mighty nation. Right now, that's not looking real favorable at this moment in time. But God still had promised him that and had brought him through so much at this point to make that a reality. He, was, he held the baton of the Abrahamic covenant. God had told him that. And it's going to even reassure him after, even again. But right now, his trust in God is so lacking. But he's being placed now in a position that all he can do is trust God and leave the results up to him. And that was hard for Jacob, because Jacob was a man who liked to keep things evidently under his control a little bit. One thing, if, if we are, we all kind of like to have some control on things. We're kind of naturally like that. But, but some people really have a problem with letting go and, ha, and just being in control of their circumstances. They've got to they've have it all figured out. But, but God will put us in positions where we can't, we, we come to realize we do not control everything. And to the point where all that we can do is trust him. And that's where Jacob was getting to. It was hard for him. But he came to finally realize that's all he could do. Or else die. Sometimes that's what God has to bring us to in order to finally get us to surrender. And help us realize he can take the wheel just fine. He can take the wheel just fine. As we see thirdly and finally, the abandoned position. Now stuck between a rock and a hard place, <laughs> Jacob finally yields. Because his only other option was to sit there and watch his family die. It's unfortunate they got to this point. But again, sometimes that's the point it has to get with us where we are completely completely helpless and our backs are against the wall. That's where Jacob was. And he finally bends and he does what he needs to do. Verse 11. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now, 
If it, this is the way it's got to be. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds, and take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Peradventure it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children... I am bereaved. What do you see here? You see a man that finally broke. He finally broke. And that's exactly what God had been waiting for in his life. And that's what God often waits for in our life. Is the position where we're finally broke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, didn't, me and Jacob didn't do what he could do. He did. I mean, all he could do was offer this gift, bring back the money, and trust the Lord. Trust the Lord to show mercy or, or lead that man, Joseph, as we would know it to be, mercy. And he, he basically surrendered the outcome of everything to the Lord. So if that's what God decides, I have no other choice. But you see, the struggle was over. Who won? God did. And Jacob. Both actually win. Because what it results in was something that nobody saw coming except God. Because when they go down into Egypt, if you know the story, they, they arrive there and Joseph has them eat dinner with him. They go through another scenario of testing, but basically what ends up happening is Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And they, I mean, they're, they, they couldn't believe it. And he explains to them all that's going on and how he's got a place for them there in Egypt that he could take care of them and they could weather the famine out together. And of course, he, he said, I want to see my father Jacob again. Here Jacob, for what amounts to be, I, I think about 19 years or so, thinking his son was dead, gets to see him alive once again, and doing quite well. <laughs> Offers them quite a retirement program. I mean, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable reversal. If you and I can, again, put ourselves into the way they would have thought and they would have felt in regards to the circumstances that had befallen all of them. I mean, unbelievable. You know, for some people, the greatest battle we'll face before a blessing is the one Jacob faced. Will we trust God, do right, do what we can, and just surrender the future to the Lord or not? Again, sometimes people fight God over things for years only to finally get to the point they realize they will never win. And finally surrendered to him only to see the good God was trying to bring. <laughs> and we hindered it the whole time because we couldn't see God's goodness beyond what we wanted and wrestled with him about. Hoping God would finally see the error his ways only to realize that we were the ones that were erroneous. I'm not saying if we surrender we'll get what we wanted or what we were hoping to get. Sometimes that does happen. But if not, it means that God had something far better to give. I remember early on in my Christian life having a real struggle with God. It was, a, it was a, one that consumed me quite a bit. And um, everything that I mentioned in the attributes I was experiencing, every one of them, I fought with God for probably a year and a half, two years over it. <laughs> Finally, one night, 
I was miserable enough to, I just bowed. I remember being by my bed and bowing to the Lord and saying, God, forgive me of this. I repent of it. And I, I want to go in a different direction. <laughs> All right, I submit. And what ended up happening, I didn't get what I was hoping to get. I got something far better. Far better. And I just look back at that now and was thinking to myself, what was I thinking? I've come to realize more and more as I go on in life that God knows what's best. And I just need to stop fighting him over that. And surrender instead of struggle. Can I encourage us today? Whatever it is we're struggling with God over, to abandon our position and submit it to him. And I believe we'll find out just what God is trying to do if we ourselves would just stop putting up such a fight. May God help us to do that. Amen. I think we'll find out that God's ways are certainly what the Bible says. Perfect. Perfect. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed. We'll just have a word of invitation. The, the pianist is going to softly play here today. And maybe today there is an issue you are struggling with. We're struggling with. I'll guarantee you, if we're not at peace in our lives about a situation, then we are struggling with God over it, I'm guessing. No, I'm struggling with another person. No, we are struggling with God. It all comes down to that. We're all struggling with God. We're struggling with the way God's allowing things to come into our lives. We're, a lot, we're struggling with God and that he's not, quote unquote, fixing the situation in our way and in our time. And we're struggling with him. But really the problem is with us to begin with. God doesn't work on our behalf until he knows that we are submitted to him. And maybe today there is a real struggle going on in our lives. Some of those attributes are there. The question is, when are we going to surrender it? When are we going to bow the knee and say, Lord, I submit to you, however you want to handle this, however you want this to go about, whatever direction you want my life you want it to go, I submit to you. And I'm sorry for putting up such a fight. The sooner we can do that, the better. <laughs> because the pressure will just continue to accumulate as it did on Jacob. May we respond to God as he has spoken to our hearts today. This is the pathway to getting God's best. His submission to the Almighty's will. And there are no doubt things that come up in our lives. I know they've come up in mine. Where I've struggled with it. But really, it's my own will, my own lack of faith, just getting in the way. May we see God's character and concern for our lives, God's love and His desire, as He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. May we